This program contains true stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Whenever possible, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. When a call for help comes in, the split-second decisions of dispatchers may make the difference between life and death. I'm William Shatner. Tonight, true stories of unexpected danger and quick response on Rescue 911. We begin in Salt Lake City, Utah, just before Christmas on a chilly winter's night. The night that this happened, my husband and I came to the house to put up the Christmas decorations for Richard. And then Margaret came while we were putting up the tree. Margaret Fisher had been hired a few weeks earlier as a nurse's aide for 59-year-old Richard Holt. A stroke and leg amputation had left him wheelchair bound. But until Margaret was hired, Richard had lived alone in the house. My brother has been a very sick man for a long time now. Margaret comes in in the evenings and stays overnight with him, does different things for him here in the house. Thank you. I don't know what we'd do without her. Call came in at 1.32 a.m. Police Department, Larry. Hi, my name is Margaret Fisher. Uh-huh. There's somebody banging on this door. Okay. And he's trying to get in. This was the first for me. I'd only been on the phones minimum time when this happened. Lori Anderson had been a dispatcher trainee for just six weeks. Do you know who this person is? No. Okay. And what is your last name? Oh, oh I'm sorry. I I'm a nurse. You're, okay, you're Morgan Fisher, huh? Okay, is that him? That's yes. not your doorbell, is it? Yes. Okay, and you don't know this person? He just keeps trying to get in. Mm-hmm. Okay. Was that your front door? Yes. I kept watching CJ to see if I was doing things right. Lori's instructor, CJ Prisbury, was monitoring the call. I'm at Mr. Holt's house. I'm taking care of him. Okay, are you calling? What's the phone number you're calling from there? Oh, God, he's banging on the door. Okay. Okay, okay we'll keep you on the line until the office. <gasps> he's in the house. Okay, he's in the, he's in the home. What do you need? I need to talk to Mr. He, right here. Okay. Ma'am? When we continue. It probably would have. What is going on? What is going on? There's nothing going on. Dispatcher trainee Lori Anderson had been on the job only six weeks when she received an unsettling 911 call. A woman named Margaret Fisher had said that a man was trying to break into the house. Seconds later, the line went dead. Police officers were immediately dispatched. 
on a burglary in progress. Female complainant states a male's at the door, ringing it, trying to get in. 215 in route. 216 in route. When the phone went dead, I didn't know what was happening. We had no idea if this person we were talking with had been hurt. But at this point, CJ, my trainer, she knew it was time to step in and let me just listen. I'm going to make the call. We'd gotten her address, phone number, the usual information, and I tried to call her back. 5790 is the one I'm talking about, Di. 72115. The last time we talked to her, she stated he'd kicked the door in. We're calling back at this time. You never know why someone is forcing entry into someone else's home. And there's a wide range of very unpleasant things that have been done to people that I've dealt with in the past. And I just needed to know what was going on, if I could. Police department, who is this? This is Mrs. Holt. Okay, who just, uh, what is going on there? I think you got a prank call. I don't think so. I'm sorry, you want to come out here? Okay, well, why would you think it's a prank call if I just called and asked what's going on? Because it's 2 in the clock in the morning, 1.30. Why are you out of breath? Pardon me? You, you seem to be out of breath. Because I walked all the way to the phone. Well, this lady called in, and I could hear the, the doorbell ringing over the phone, and I heard someone kicking on the door, and then I heard the door open up. So I don't think it's a prank. You, I think you need to tell me what's really happening there. Well, if you want to come out here, you come on out. We are out there, but I want you to tell me what's happening. 216-215, call back indicates a uh, male on the line stating uh, he doesn't know what we're talking about. He's out of breath, possible suspect. Your mind is going a million miles a second trying to think of something to keep him on the phone until the officers get there. If he's wasting his energy talking to me, he's not beating up on someone. He's not raping someone. He's not shooting someone. What is going on? There is nothing going on, miss. That is baloney. Why did this lady, very, very frightened, was on the phone? Who else uh, is there in that house with you? Is there anyone else there? There's no one else here. There's somebody in the background, isn't there? Uh, hold on one second. What? Hi, this is the police department. Uh-huh. Were we just speaking with you? Uh-huh. And who is this man? I don't know. It's okay. Uh. No, it's not okay, and we're, we're going to be inside your house in a second, but tell me who he is. Uh. Do you know him? No. Does he belong there? No. Have you ever seen him before in your life? Uh-uh. Has he hurt you? Almost. Well, why don't you put him back on the phone with me, okay, ma'am? Uh. Tell him I want to talk to him again. He wants to, I want to talk to you. Hello. Okay, please tell me what's going on. This is my mother here. She was just freaking out. Okay, why couldn't you tell me this in the first place? Because she was grabbing the phone from me. The thought ran through my mind. We have little old ladies that get very confused that don't know who their family is. And the guy was so insistent that it was a very slight possibility. Everything's okay, and she's just freaking out. Okay, now, now let's just start from the beginning, okay? Sure. Why did you have to, you know, kick in your own door? Why is she so I afraid? didn't kick it in. She opened it. Son, I think. Why was she so afraid? Because she thought, I guess, she thought it was someone else. I don't know. She still sounded like she was afraid. Mom, are you afraid? This is not working. She said no. Mom, I, doesn't matter what she just said. I want you to tell me what's, you know, what the deal is. We weren't sure what we had. It sounded more like a family fight. Officer Roger Williams arrived within two minutes. 216 in the area. 216 133. He waited outside for additional information and backup units. 216, do you have anybody on the line at this time? for the male, he's indicating that he thinks his mother's freaking out and that he kicked the door down to get in his own house. And for, I can hear noises now coming from the rear of the house. We had told the officers we had contact back in the house, so they were holding off. You may have a hostage situation if he knows that the police are outside, and that's the last thing we want. As far as I knew up to that point, there was a suspicious man and there was Miss Fisher in the house. All I wanted was to get to the bottom of what was happening. 
Okay, just start from the beginning, very simply. Okay, I came home from a bar, drunk. Uh-huh. And when I came home, uh -huh. she was sitting here. She was all afraid. When you came home, she was, uh, you know, she called us after you started ringing the doorbell and kicking on the door. Yeah, because she thought it was someone else. Did you think of yelling out, Mom, it's me? Uh, no, I didn't. I'm sorry. It probably would have. What is going on? What is going on? There's nothing going on. Baloney, tell me what's going on. There's nothing going on. Why is she screaming? Because. No, that's bullshit. Not because. Tell me what is going on. There's nothing going on, Mom. That is baloney. I'm sorry. I, I don't think you think I'm a cretin that is going to think nothing's going on. There's nothing going on. That's baloney. I don't believe it for a second. And the line went dead. I wasn't sure what it was I heard. I didn't know who had been shot at or had been shot, if anyone had. She, something happened, and she screamed, and there was a wrestling around. I wanted to pick up the phone again and talk to me. I was totally cut off at that point from information. Units on 3rd West, mention of a gun. Officers Williams and Jensen rushed to cover the front and back exits. I walked up to the front door where I couldn't be seen. It came together real fast that it was a robbery. Mike, I've got a guy inside the house. He's screaming at somebody. You want to come around here? We can go in the front. He turned, and I saw that he had a gun. He was coming out the front door. We wanted to prevent a hostage situation and let him come out on his own. Got a gun. It runs through your mind, this may be it. Maybe the only way to stop him is with the use of deadly force. Are they inside yet? Police, drop the gun now! I can't get oh. this is, Tell me what's happening. Oh, he got the gun and he He's got his gun. Outside. They got him. What is he, why is he, is the police, are the police there? Huh? Okay, the police have got this man. Yes. Okay, do you have any idea who he is? No, I've never seen him before. Are you okay? Are you okay? <laughs> oh. Are you all right? Yeah. Did he hurt you okay, at I'm all? I'm taking care of somebody that has had such a bad heart. I'm sorry. Do it was in that part of the conversation that I finally figured out there was a third person in the house. This Mr. Holt had the gun in the bedroom. He got out of bed and... Uh, oh. I realized that Mr. Holt is the one that shot at the burglar. Ma'am, hello? Hello? All that the man had managed to take was $86 that Margaret had found in the house. Richard Holt suffered minor injuries as a result of his struggle with the intruder, but no one was shot. Stand up. Come on, let's go. According to the details in the report, the guy was looking for an easy hit for some drug money. If the dispatcher hadn't have distracted him with the telephone, it could have really deteriorated into a serious situation. I think the, the lives of the older gentleman and the, the woman may have been in danger. There's no set plan. There's no policy or procedure you can, you can find to tell you how to handle stuff like that. It's something you learn after a long period of time doing this. Looking back on the situation, being a trainee, I think that if I had been on my own with this call, I may have believed him and said, OK, goodbye, rather than keeping him on the line. I've never talked to a burglar before. I've never had one pick up the phone before. They don't usually answer the phone. And it was just lucky that he decided to pick up that ringing phone and spend some time chatting with me. One six, we've got one in custody with a gun. The suspect arrested that night was charged with Careful. aggravated burglary, an aggravated robbery, and pleaded guilty to one count of burglary. One month later, the events of that night still haunt Margaret and Richard. After I fired the gun, he just kept coming after me. It didn't faze him a bit. Richard remembers how close he came to losing his life. When the guy put the gun to my head, I thought it was all over. I really did. 
I know I could have been gone in a split second. The night after the incident, Margaret returned to take care of Richard. I was so scared. I was thinking that nobody was coming, nobody showed up, and I didn't know what to do. I started to run outside, and then I thought, what will I do if he does something to Richard? She did one hell of a job. She stayed calm. She answered my questions. She kept picking up the phone. And she did as good with a bad situation as she possibly could. She's a lot of comfort to me. She's become a good friend of mine. And I look forward to her coming in at night. I really do. Next. They were thrashing their tails. And uh, if you're ever hit with one of the tails, it would be like a fly being hit with the fly swatter. You would just be instantly killed. There's no question there. On the eastern coast of Canada lies the unspoiled beauty of Prince Edward Island. For hundreds of years, the local townsfolk made their living from fishing. On October 1st, 1989, an unlikely group of islanders banded together to try and give something back to the sea. It was a cold, windy Sunday morning in autumn. Fishery officer Florian Bryan was supposed to be on vacation. I received a phone call from a fellow fishery officer, Sheldon Bryan, advising that he had received a report that there was um, apparently what uh, was described to me as whales, or a whale, stranded at or near Cove Head Harbor. Florian immediately went to investigate. I just couldn't believe my eyes when I approached the entrance to the harbor there and I looked out and all I could see was this mass configuration of animals or mammals of some shape or description on the shore. So I walked down to the uh, shoreline as close as I could get to the whales and I realized by counting that there wasn't one. I was positive of five at least and possibly a sixth. Six sperm whales, 40 to 65 feet in length, had become beached on a sandbar just offshore. Stranding expert Patricia Gray explained what would happen if they were not freed quickly. When a whale beaches itself, the weight of its body will press down on its internal organs. And uh, very often you can have uh, a, you know, hemorrhaging taking place and uh, the lungs can fill up with blood, pools of blood. The other danger is that uh, just the combination of the sun and the wind can make them so hot that they cook to death. Whales can only live a certain period of time exposed and beached on the shore as such. It's hours, it's not days that we're dealing with here. I approached a couple of fishermen, Linus Meisner and Fred Morrison, who both fish from Cove Head Harbor, and I said, uh, the only chance I see of saving them is to uh, secure a rope to their tails and see if we can make an effort to pull them off. Basically, that's the only approach I have open. And he said, well, the first thing we need is boats. If we're going to try and rescue them, so I said, that's no problem. I made sandwiches, first of all, we'll have to go out in the boat, and no doubt about it. And even at that point, we didn't have a clue what we could do, but I felt they were saying, help, help, do something for us, you know. One of the older fishermen in the harbor, he jumped down in his boat, and he threw up a brand new coil of three quarter inch nylon rope. He said, here, use it. It's almost impossible to break it. Local diver John McLeod also said he'd help. He and some other divers took on the difficult job of tying the rope to the whales. Yeah, if you think it's safe, we'll go with it. Yeah. If you feel there's any danger, it's it. We're not gonna, we're not gonna take any chances or risk any lives. I love nature. I do a lot of diving and enjoy what is in the water. So when you're confronted with one of the largest mammals in the world, we said to ourselves, I'm sure everyone felt the same, is that we have a very important job here to do. Let's give it 100% and see if we can get it done. Everything is okay. We've got the fishermen lined up with their boats and the divers are on their way. And everything's pretty well going in place. The plan was risky, but everyone agreed to it, including Patricia Gray. 
they had no other alternative to do what they could. Uh, there was, it would be absolutely impossible for them to try and lift the whales or to, to put a harness around them or to use a helicopter or anything like that. I mean, you're, you're looking at something that's 58 tons, you know, and that's a very, very large animal. There was quite a surf running in, and they were stranded on a sandbar. There was probably three to four feet of the whale embedded in the sand, being that the surf had washed it out. So you had to be very careful that you didn't get in between the whale and this hollow that they dug, because it would just roll over and squish you. They were thrashing their tails. And uh, if you ever hit with one of the tails, it would just be like a fly being hit with the fly swatter. You would just be instantly killed. There's no question there. When you would uh, walk away from them, their eyes would actually follow you. And then they'd shut their eyes and they would make a moaning sound. The Coast Guard donated nylon straps for the divers to fasten around the whale's enormous tails that would not cut into their flesh. The helicopter pilot was then going to carry the rope to the boat. We discussed their plan of approach, which was to go out and walk up on each side of the whale about eight to 10 feet from the whale and put the rope behind the tail of the whale, pull it back under and secure it, whereby they would not come in direct contact with the whale so as to disturb them or make them upset. Fearing the noise of the helicopter and its downwash might distress the whales, a man on a jet ski took the other end of the rope out to the fishing boat. The securing of the whales went very well. The divers followed the instructions that were given. They uh, had the straps in place and uh, the uh, boats were in place. Everything was a go. The biggest risk, I think, was to keep the boats out in deep enough water. There was quite a current going east that day. The boats are sliding down shore almost faster than we could keep them, keep them up the shore to get a decent pull on them. That was, that was the, my biggest worry, was we we're going to be aground. The whale started to thrash its tail frantically, and we backed out of the way and said, oh, here we go, we're going to finally get one of these whales back in the water. The rope just came hurling back like an elastic band. It broke that one inch nylon rope as if it was a piece of string. We made three attempts, and all three attempts failed. There was a lot of comment going around the wharf. Uh, well, you're wasting your time. It's impossible. You know, there's no way you're ever going to get these whales free. But I was determined, and I can tell you the fishermen were more determined, and the divers were equally as determined and we requested that we be given one more chance to try it. As the day went on, they were being probably dehydrated. They were on their sides. The surf was washing into their blowhole with sand. It, you know, definitely not good for them. The tide was going, and so there was less chance to get these whales off. They located a stronger rope and rushed it to the scene. Everyone agreed to try one more time to pull the whale free. So there's your triple rope, okay? Right on. Take that down. So you come back and you put your bolt and your boat yeah. over here. Yeah. And you got your end free to hook onto two inch hosser. And if that doesn't pull them off. They tied the both boats together, the stern of one to the bow of the other. Uh, they could, would just keep enough pressure, like they would not add lunges with the rope. They would just keep a nice steady pressure. And everything was just shaking aboard the boat. And, and he was flipping and flapping around there, and he must have dug a bigger hole. sudden snap could uh, break the tail, damage the vertebrae of the whale. So it was just a steady, consistent pull with an increase of the throttle as we went along. Uh, 
I'll never forget the time as long as I live. At 6.14, that first big whale floated off the shore. I jumped and shouted, but my shout was nothing as to the 7,000 people that were on the shore. We could hear it out in the boat. They're just loud acclaim that, you know, hooray, that was it. The only time I was a little bit worried when we towed the first whale off, that I didn't know how he was going to act. <laughs> he could have smashed the boat or something, you know, once we got him in the deep water where he could work. He just laid right quiet. We hauled up the tail up to the boat, cut the rope off, and then he swam away. I think they were smart enough to know that we were trying to help them. The tide was going out, and the job became more difficult. It took longer to tow the larger whales off. We made two or three attempts, like towing them at, at different angles. We were trying to rescue the whales, not in any means try to hurt them, for sure. By 9 p.m., they managed to pull the last living whale free. Only one had died before they could rescue it. To our satisfaction, we did get five off. All five were alive when we released them. It was just something inside that really hit me emotionally that you wanted to cry with joy, not sadness, but you just wanted to express yourself in it by crying. You felt so good. And when Linus Meisner gave me that high five going by in his boat that night, uh, I don't think I've ever experienced a feeling of that in my life. There was people, I don't know, biologists, I don't know who, said if you hook onto their tails, you're going to break their backs, or... I said, it's the only way to do it. And we done it, and it proved out. It felt good, you know. We had spent a, a lot of time, and were cold, and, had, had, you know, I guess we did risk our lives. At that time, we probably didn't think we actually were, but it was a very fulfilling feeling to see them being pulled out into deeper water. If we hadn't succeeded, I don't know how it would have felt, but uh, what the heck, we did succeed. And that feeling was there, and I still have it, and I want to have it until the day they put me down on me. Next. One minute they're there, next minute they're not. I didn't really know what to think. On an average day, the Mid-Georgia Ambulance Service receives dozens of calls for help and usually responds to the scene within eight minutes. But October 1st, 1989 was not just an average day. Around three in the afternoon, a call for help came into dispatcher Pam Bowman. Mid-Georgia Ambulance, how do you mean? BSO calls, it's coming from Road and Bonnie Gibble Road to get it to us. Road it was at least a two-car accident when it was called in. At this time, we didn't know that it would be more than that. Uh, two-car accident, at least a two-car accident, Bonnie Gilbert Road, with injuries. Neil, you want to go on this one? Yeah. Yeah. Most of the time, if we have another truck available, the truck will back up that one, just in case there's more patients to be transported. It was pouring down rain, which it had been all day, and the roads were real slick. We had had a lot of accidents that day. Two ambulances headed to the scene with number 23 bringing up the rear. Cardiac technician Tom Kane was on the radio and EMT Neil Stevens was driving. The two ambulances kept in close contact because of the weather. The lead ambulance was driven by paramedic Steve Parker. It was dangerous conditions and uh, at one point we did have a problem. We went through a dip in the road and hit a, a large water puddle. It did slide a little bit, and we notified the other truck to be careful. Y'all watch out for that water back there. As they rounded a curve, the lead ambulance lost sight of number 23. One minute they're there, next minute they're not. I didn't really know what to think. Twenty-two. 
Amen to 11 and 23. Tom and I were scheduled to get married, and the first thing I thought of was that they had seen an accident that maybe Steve had not seen, and they had stopped to render aid, and maybe they were out of the truck, which was why I tried on the big radio, because they would have a portable with them. When they didn't answer on that, I really, I don't know what went through except that something was wrong. The fire hybrid had ripped a hole in the ambulance's gas tank. Just not knowing and being real scared and not wanting to think about the worst. But if you've ever worked this profession, then you've seen the worst and you know what vehicles can do. You know what the rain does, you know what the roads do. You have a situation called patient abandonment, that when you receive a call and uh, you do not respond for some reason, you can be held liable. So we continued on the call. I was nervous and upset. Steve came up on the radio and told me that maybe I needed to send uh, the fire department over there to see what had happened to them, that maybe they had stopped for an accident or something was wrong. A Georgia Power Company troubleshooter on his way to work had seen the accident happen. And as I ran over there, there was an opening in the windshield, just enough to get my fingers in there. He was a hefty guy, but just seemed like something just took over, just took control. The man finally managed to pull Tom out of the wreck, though Tom was twice his weight. I said to myself, ain't no way I'm going back in there. And by that time, I was back in there. The man then got Neil's jam seat belt undone somehow and pulled him to safety as well. See, if he had just even hesitated for a second, we'd have been dead. We've been to people that have doused themselves in, in gas and burn and live for a few hours afterwards. And that's one of the most painful ways to die I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of people die. I thought, how did I survive that? That's just remarkable. He's just an average built person. Obviously not real strong, not strong enough to miraculously pull a 350-pound Tom out of the ambulance. The only thing that I could explain how it happened would be the adrenaline that happens in a situation that way. Our bodies sometimes can be pushed further than we think. I never had that feeling before. It's just like a, a force, like energy. And I know if it wasn't for that feeling, that instinct, it wouldn't happen. If we hadn't gotten out in the next 10, 15 seconds, we'd be dead right now. We'd be six foot under. Uh, we owe our life to that man. Tom called in, and it was a real short conversation. I'm on a cellular phone uh -huh. at Macon Memorial Park. Our motor car is The ambulance is split, it's burned, we're out, we're okay. Okay. Bye. I wanted to know, I wanted to see for myself and I knew I couldn't. And the fact that we couldn't do anything about it, that we had to still keep working as if nothing was wrong. If another call had came in, we'd st I'd still have to take it. S Steve and Tim still had to go on their call. And it wasn't that we didn't care or that we weren't real upset. It's just that's just what we do. Concerned that he would be late to work, the man simply got into his pickup and drove off without telling anyone his name. A few minutes later, I was asking people where he was, and somebody said, oh, he left. He's gone. 
And I turn around and said, but you don't understand. I got to go thank this man. He just saved my life. A good Samaritan rescued two people from a burning ambulance. By the next day, everyone in Macon was trying to find out who the mysterious hero was. Dophy Thomas heard the news and knew they were looking for his co-worker, Norris Thomas. The man then vanished in the accident scene before anybody could get his name. Authorities are hoping this good Samaritan will come forward and identify himself. Norris is sort of a reserve type person, you know. Certainly I wouldn't, you know, go in his privacy without uh, talking to him. But Dophy wanted Norris to get the credit he deserved. It was just something that I did, and I just leave. I don't wait for him to come out and thank me for doing something like that. I just, just went ahead on and left. Good morning. Once he had permission, Dophy gave Norris's name to the people at Mid-Georgia Ambulance. I heard on the radio coming to work, you're trying to find a guy that pulls your people out of your ambulance. I, I kind of got excited because, you know, I know this. You know, word's kind of getting out what a good thing my buddy's done, you know. And I went up and shook his hand and, and told him on behalf of my family, uh, my parents and my wife, that I thank him for, for pulling me out. He told me, he said, let's just play this down. And I said, but Norris, what you did was, was out of the ordinary. I said, you saved my life. He said, Norris, you did a great thing. My job is to go out and save people's lives every chance I get. And he said, that's what you did. That's what you did for me. And, you know, I, I, I was stunned for a little while after he said that. And I, I never did realize that. I never did think about it that way. Two and a half months later, Pam and Tom were married. To be pulled out by a bystander instead of us pulling the bystander out, it's kind of a, a swap on the tables. And it's just, it's nice to know that somebody out there is willing to risk their lives for us. Next. I was losing the battle against time. My baby is slipping away. Twenty-eight-year-old Donna Beauchel was well-trained in life-saving techniques, and twice before she had used those skills to save the lives of two local children. But on November 14, 1989, one of Donna's own kids would desperately need her help. Donna had stayed in Norfolk, Virginia with her four kids while her husband was overseas with the Navy. On that morning, she was home with her daughter, Sarah, and her youngest, 23-month-old Ryan. I was sitting at the, the dining room table looking through newspapers because I like to send my husband articles about what's happening with the Navy around here or just the local news. That's a good boy, Ryan. The men overseas like to hear what's happening in their hometown. Around 9 a.m., Robert Gower and Donald Coleman arrived to finish installing an air conditioning unit in back of Donna's house. This was our last day on the job, and uh, we'd only had about a half a day's left of work to do. Being a mother of four children, I seem to be able to tune in to where my, what my kids are doing, even when they're out of my sight or if I'm not looking directly at them. Got your tape measure? No, I'm just kidding. Take it over there and back to get your drill plug in. Get your measurement on that corner. All right. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Look at that. <laughs> The first thing I noticed was the baby reach up on top of the TV. And I thought he was just reaching up to pick up a magazine. Uh, 
Brian! Come on, baby. Come on, baby. I knew right away that he was choking on something, but I had no idea what. Mommy! Ryan! Cough it up! Come on, Ryan! Cough it up, baby! Come on! Ryan! Ryan! Come on, Ryan! Ryan! Then there was no change at all. Oh, God. He still had a total blockage of air. I didn't see anybody, but I did see the contractor's truck. And then I thought, the Heimlich maneuver. Ryan! Come on, Ryan. Come on, baby. Cough it up, baby. Come on. Come on, Ryan. Ryan! Ryan! I was losing the battle against time. Come on, Ryan. Come on, sweetheart. Come on, baby. My baby is slipping away. Come on, Ryan! I definitely needed help. It had been two minutes since Ryan stopped breathing. I really didn't know what we could do. Thought to myself, just go up there and try to do something. Neither of the men had training in first aid. Yeah, do. Go down now and watch. Okay. Yeah, he's not breathing either, dog. Not the police, Montana Farrington. I, I saw a baby that's choking. Come on, boy. See if you feel something in his throat. I don't see or feel anything. Watch out. Is he not breathing at all? He's breathing a little bit. Then he's going to be okay. Just calm down, ma'am. As long as he's breathing, he'll be okay. Just stay on the line with me for just a second. I absolutely, I just couldn't look. I don't think I wanted to know if the baby had passed out yet. I just couldn't handle it at that moment. Come on, son. He was struggling for air. I mean, I could tell he wasn't breathing. He was just, like, gasping and, uh... I said, you know, I thought to myself, man, we, we got problems here, you know. I don't know if it's going to work, dog. Come on. Uh, then I thought, we let's try this Heimlich maneuver. Um, Let me try this. I didn't know how to do it, but I just, I've seen pictures of it done and heard people talk about how it's done, so I just tried that. Come on, come on, boy. Spit it up. Come on, son. It was like total relief. I just picked him up and just wanted to hold him really tight and was so thankful that he was okay. Lucky. He's all right now, isn't he? Ryan has suffered no ill effects from the incident. Three months later, he seems to have forgotten all about it. The whole event was extremely terrifying. You feel this overwhelming responsibility to this child who is looking to you to make it all better. And here comes a situation where you can't make it all better. It was very overwhelming. Sarah and Ryan are are very close, so she's always looking out for him. I'm glad we're in the church because I love him. The emotional factor really kicks in when it's your own. I mean, it never crossed my mind not to help. I mean, how can somebody ask you to help her in a situation like that? How can you, you know, you can't say no. I didn't have time to think about it, really. I just ran up and tried to do what I could do, you know or whatever I could do to help. I thought it was very ironic that they have no training and I've been trained for 10 years. They didn't think twice about being in, getting involved. They are very special men. They saved his life. If you are interested in learning life-saving techniques, contact the American Heart Association or the American Red Cross. Many communities do not yet have 911, but emergency numbers for your area are listed inside the phone book and children should be taught how to use them. 
This program is dedicated to the heroic men and women who risk their own lives to save the life of a stranger. I'm William Shatner. Join me next week for more true stories on Rescue 911.